all for coming back and joining us. Um, sorry for the delay there, um, but uh, another exciting afternoon and a continuation of the reactive transport modeling. Um, this will be our second tutorial session um, and uh, Roloff uh, Versteeg and Becca Rubenstein will um, uh, lead us off here. So go, go on, <laughs> proceed. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, so yeah, so my name is uh, Roloff Versteeg and I'll uh, start this presentation and then hand it over to Rebecca uh, about halfway there. So what the objective of this session is, is um, first to talk a little bit and we'll echo uh, some of the material and think even some of the same uh, figures as the presenters in the morning there. So we'll talk about the challenge of an possible approach to scaling of reactive transfer modeling of microbial processes. We'll introduce a hands-on online modeling tutorial with interactive reactive transfer modeling. And we discuss a pres and present the pipeline for automated microbial modeling using K-base and P-Floatran. So, um, well, you know, why use reactive transport models? Basically, Tim uh, already answered this morning, uh, but basically microbes exist in space and time, and, you know, reactive transport models are designed for this. So uh, I think we all like this figure. Uh, we think it's a really nice figure. Um, and basically it shows all these different processes, but also shows this, the space and time that these processes occur over. You know, so obviously if we want to model the system, uh, we need to sort of go outside of K-base and start using reactive transport models. So, so what is one of the challenges? Well, uh, after this workshop, uh, um, you probably all want to model microbial dynamics. You may also want to have a, a beverage of your choice, but let's not talk about that. And, and these, these, they want to model at multiple scales, at temporal, spatial, multiple dimensions, multiple locations. And so there may be millions of models that you would like to build and run. And uh, that's of course a bit of a challenge, you know, because, you know, it's sort of hard to build these models. So how do we do that? And, and I really, uh, actually I made this figure at the previous, uh, for a previous presentation, and I really like this slide. Uh, on one hand, we have like a, a Lumina sequencer, and on the right hand, we have a monk from the Middle Ages, and it's a mismatch between data generation and model generation capabilities. And any uh, resemblance to an actual modeler is uh, purely coincidental. Um, so, you know, you see a um, model generation very slowly taking its time, and at the same time, this machine is spitting out data, and, and, and that's one of the big challenges over there. And so the question is, why is scaling hard? And, 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 and thinking about it, we really thought there's really three ways. And, and first is that like acquiring understanding of what's involved in modeling is complex. I mean, you know, and especially if you're not a modeler by training, but if you're uh, more maybe a microbiologist or, 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 or a hydrologist, uh, learning reactive transport modeling is actually complex. The second part is getting all the data together is time and labor consuming, especially if the data is heterogeneous, come from different sources over there. And the last part is building and running uh, these microbial models is complex. So what can we do about it? Well, um, uh, first, make it easy to acquire basic understanding of modeling. And of course, that's what this workshop is about. And second, develop and provide data management, automation, discovery, and access mechanisms. And, and third is create a microbial modeling pipeline that uses K-based and P-flow so that you can easily create and run models. And that's what to really talk about in the remainder of this seminar. So what I'll do in the remainder of the seminar uh, between me and Becca is we'll talk about an online hands-on tutorial, which should allow everybody to understand key aspects of modeling. We'll briefly go into aspect of data management, discovery and access mechanism. That's a whole presentation in itself. So I'll just basically allude to some components. And finally, we'll just demonstrate result of a microbial modeling pipeline that uses K-base and P-Floatran. Okay, so um, we, you know, uh, under funding from uh, the Department of Energy and SBR award, uh, we built an online modeling course. And the reason we did it is basically we needed educated collaborators and, and why we work with a whole number of different people. And we found that time and time again, uh, we, we were answering questions, say, you know, collaborators don't need to become modelers, they need to understand the modeling basis. So we created the course and the key is to make it interactive, hands-on modeling to provide intuitive insight. If you show people equations, it becomes very hard. If you say to people, hey, here's a model, you can change the model and see the output, it becomes easier. So, the course was designed to have a low activation energy, so there's no need to install p uh, an intuitive GUI, and hopefully uh, you'll like it. So to get access to this course, um, you go to this uh, URL here, learn.subserviceinsight.com, and I'll leave it up on the screen for a moment. 
should be a little button that says request access that gives this second window. You type in your email and you confirm that you're not a robot and then you request access. And then um, you get a registration link and with the registration links, you can get a, a, a password and then you can log in to this to the course. So then you go back to the same thing and you're using you know, normal thing with your uh, credentials. Um, We'll send these registration links in probably about like 10 or 15 minutes from now. So you can register right now and then uh, you'll get these links and then you can start playing around with this, with this, with this course over there. So um, we, this course uh, and actually uh, there are actually several collaborators in the list of acknowledgement is, is not meant to be a graduate course in, in, in reactive transport. It's a comprehensive introduction, which is really designed for, for people who wanna know reactive transport modeling well, maybe play around with them, but you know, this is not a graduate course, you know, this doesn't replace like going, you know, getting a PhD. We provide an overview of modeling and visualization concepts, chemistry, flow and transport, numerical modeling, and P flow train basics. And throughout the course, we have an interactive capability to run P flow train models. Um, if you see any bugs or have any course comment suggestions, you can send an email to this address here or even to me or Rebecca. Okay, so uh, the navigation of the course should be pretty straightforward over there. Uh, basically, and I'll show it here in a moment, uh, you go in the course and you can navigate your sections and subsections and, and, and whatnot. Okay, so what is the key piece of the course? And, and I don't want to spend too much time on it, but it's basically P flow trend. Uh, you've got the introduction this morning, so I won't belabor what P flow trend is and what it does over there, but it's a really, really great course. You know, it can do all this really cool stuff. Um, you know, and, and uh, here's a list of the capabilities over there. And it's, it's great. If you float in, it's sort of like everybody should, should, should buy one. Okay, and actually it's free, so everybody gets for free. Now, what is the problem with P float in, as you may have noticed this morning, it's getting it to run and getting it to do what you want when you're not, haven't been sort of included in the clan and don't know the secret handshake, it's sort of challenging. And that's some of the things we, we try to deal with. So what we did, and, and this again was, was developed under an SBAR proposal effort, is we basically exposed the flow model to a browser interface. So the architecture is, is the following. We basically have a, a visual interface, which I'll show you in a moment over there, and you get to play with yourself. And that visual interface um, uh, talks to a server. The server stores models in a relational database. We use uh, automatic in-file generation using PyFlowTran and open source code to develop by Satish Kara. And then those models get sent to a uh, HPC resource, uh, which has a standard PyFlowTran. So on the HPC resource, we have a PyFlowTran scheduler, which is a very simple like Python uh, code, which basically uh, listens for requests and then executes uh, these models and sends the results back. And then to the front end, you can um, uh, visualize the results over there. Okay, and so the architecture is really nice because first of all, it ex allows to expose model parameters. We can say, hey, uh, as you may have seen, a P flow ten model may have like 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 tens or hundreds of parameters. We can say, okay, this is the parameter that people want to like like change with. You know, we can expose that, and people can change it over there. Um, the other thing is it allows to do programmatic model building and modification, and I'll I'll show that in a moment here. You know, so we're very happy with this this interface. Okay, so a little bit of housekeeping. Um, once you get an account, uh, and I'll show you where these buttons are, turn off auto run and sweep models, um, comments and it. Right now the interface in the backend use the currently stable pfoten version, which is version two. Uh, Glenn Hammond and his colleagues are busy to upgrade to version three. Once it is stable and released, we'll upgrade to version three. So right now, if you install version three and you download the in files from our interface, you'll have to modify them. Uh, if you register, we won't bug you, but you may send you an email once in a while about you know course updates and the like. Okay. Um, with that being said, uh, let's uh, let's take a look at the course there. You know, so here. Um, okay. So right now I'm uh, actually uh, logged into the course here. Um, can everyone see my screen here? So this is the, the the course interface there. And so one of the first thing I want to show here is is some of the details about how you look at the, the model output okay and so uh one of the things to realize is we can model in different dimensions zero one two or three d and we can also model in, in time or instantaneous basically like a like a beaker reaction and so you can have a model anyway from zero d zero t to three d one t and different models provide different understanding 
Now, if we look at the output results, and this is sort of like, like and, and, and that may have been covered to some extent this morning, is we can either, and we'll here have a very simple model, a 1D, 1T model, where we have basically 10 blocks, and we basically look at these blocks at different time step, one, zero minute, one, up to five minutes. And we can either look at a specific uh, uh, location over time, or we can at a specific time over all the locations over there, okay? And in PFLOTRAN, the tech file uh, is, is typically this file over here, and the H5 is, is that file over here. And PFLOTRAN can generate these both uh, files there. Now, if you look at this interface here, there's basically a discussion about how these different models relate and how you can visualize these results over here, okay? So, uh, and again, like, you know, you can sort of hear some introductions, fundamentals, like whatever, and models in space and time, and so on. Okay, so, um, now let's take at the model, and this is this is really the simplest model one, one can can use over there. Okay, and it is a uh, uh, it's essentially like a zero d zero t uh, equals complexation model over there. Okay, so uh, so what we have over here it's it's it's, it's a very simple model. Uh, essentially, um, you know, we basically have like CO two fully mixed CO two, and we have like a variety of different. Uh, 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 reactions going on over there, and we can calculate what happens. Okay, and so when we what what happens is now when we press this button, I'm running a model. I'm basically sending a model to the server. The server runs the model and, and brings the result back. Now this is a very boring model because basically it only gives me one data point back, zero d zero t. What I can do here, I say, hey, let me change the modality and use a range of the modality here. And you see, we'll see on the interfaces that the ability to do that uh, is actually. Uh, pretty much on, on all these models over here. And so what happens right now is it says, hey, I have a different range over there. And um, I have, uh, uh, for all these modalities, I have basically like a pH that I get for a thing. And you see, you, you know, what you what you expect to see over there, you know? So uh, basically you see that, um, you know, your, your increased modality, you decrease the pH in the model, which is what you expect. Okay, so now what I was doing, I was running this model in real time over here, and you can play around with it once you get an account uh, on the on the system. Okay, um, let's see, how am I doing time there? Okay, uh, pretty good. Okay, so now the, the second model here, so this is sort of a boring model, the second model is is a, a, a little more, more complex model. Okay, so again here, uh, click on this model here, and now we have a model which basically is the, the, the transport to a, um, um, uh, through a, a, a column over here. So let's see. Okay. okay, so here what we have here is essentially a, a very simple model. We basically have a, a column where we have a concentration at the beginning, concentration at the end, and we run a conservative tracer through the column over there. Okay, and I'll just start right now with, with running a range of models over there and uh, like like running the uh, uh, running these models over there. So right now, number of jobs are being generated, the being sent over there, and these is the uh, the fluxes to these models over there. Okay, is this what we expect to see? Uh, basically, as we increase the flux velocity, which is shown here on the right hand side, the these decrease the concentration quicker from the initial value over there. So this is what you expect to see. Now you can also go back to this model and say, okay, let me show the menu here, and say, okay, rather than looking in 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 tech, let me look at the, in in the H5 over there, and basically look at in in X and uh, look uh, uh, here um, basically. And what you see here is uh, sort of what you expect is essentially uh, the concentration, of course, for all the models is the same at the beginning over there, which is sort of boring. But then if you look later in time, you see um, different uh, different behavior over there. Okay. Now, one of the nice thing about it is that you can go to this model over here and say, well, here's actually all these models which have been generated. So here is the uh, actual uh, 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 in file, the model file that you can download and, and, and play around with uh, in your interface. You can also look at the H5 file and even the output file over there, which is uh, not that exciting over there. Okay. And so... Um, so we got a whole number of different models over there. And it, if you look at the course, we have models of increasing complexity. You know, basically uh, you have uh, models at acid mine drainage and, and uh, uh, infiltration, uh, you know, adversion uh, things there. And so what the nice thing about it is you can go to these models over there and you can interact with them. So you can change these parameters. You can put your value in there. So here, you know, you say, hey, I want to change this, make, make my value, move it, move it back and forth over there. And you can play around with these models. And the nice thing about it is because this, the course is set up so that we have like this incremental change in these models there, you can actually like, like say, hey, does it actually make sense what I do? And the nice thing about it is also visit going back and forth between different visualization uh, 
uh, capabilities and saying, hey, let me look in space, let me look in time and really make sure that they get it and say, hey, what happens if I, if I get something over there, okay? Um, now, um, okay, as I mentioned, you can download this interface tile. Um, now, uh, we're not really sure how many people are gonna be hitting the server and there's some models which are actually quite complex. There's some uh, models from Peter Lickner, which is like 3D models over there. So um, if things are getting really slow, we'll add some more resources over there, but um, just, just to you know, let you know. Okay, we'll switch over. So now we can do these models over there and uh, well, what's one of the problems is in building these models, you need more than just microbiological data. You need contextual data. And actually have to think, uh, 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 James Stegan for that, uh, that, that comment over there. Uh, and what is the contextual data? Well, uh, depending whether in the water or in, in the soil, it's soil temperature, elevation, soil moisture, soil radiation, vegetation cover, river station flow, remote sensing data, snow thickness. And here on the right hand side, it shows some data. This is actually data from Sentinel, which uh, at the Connecticut River, we're doing some work over there uh, where you can different bands and you can look what happens. This is uh, data from a snow tail station in, in, in Colorado. This is some data from own temperature sensors. Actually, it's interesting. Um, so we have temperature adapt here in the soil. And actually this is the part of the, the temperature probe is sticking out of the ground. So you see this high temporal variation over there. A lot of this data can, you, can be discovered through APIs. Um, but in really, in, in, in order to work with that, you need data normalization and integration in a robust architecture. And a large part of what we're doing is focused on that. And that's actually one of the things which I think is, uh, you know, whoever is, is, is looking at this is, you know, make sure you can deal with large amount of data and, and heterogeneous data is a really important thing. And so that, that's, that's something which is near and dear to my heart. I won't spend too much time on it. I'll gladly answer any questions. So, so maybe you thought, hey, they got this cloud-based P flow trend and they got web-based K-base. Can we glue them together to create a microbial modeling pipeline? And yes, we can. Okay, so uh, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'm gonna hand it over to, to Rebecca who will take it from here. So um, I'll stop sharing my screen. Rebecca, you ready to take over? Yep. Okay. Okay, everyone should be able to see now. Yeah, I can see. Okay. Um, so this is actually a case study that we presented a little bit ago. So it's familiar to some of you, but um, certainly not to the whole audience. And it's both relevant and we think a really cool example. So I'm just gonna go through this very quickly. We looked at um, river sediment samples from the Hanford site corrected by Emily Graham et al. Um, which included um, I lost this slide, sorry. Um, which included a bunch of metagenomics as well as metabolomics and metaproteomics um, from the right in lab. And they worked with us to interpret this data and get our models um, uh, curated. So the first step in our pipeline is to define our system. And for comparison, we also used a sort of literature-based model uh, of what you'd see in a standard textbook, very generic microbes compared to, you can see the site-specific model has very specific genomes, uh, which we used in K-base to build models. The chemistry similarly is extremely simple on that classical textbook style um, model. And again, very complicated in the realistic one based on the right and groups analysis. So even though those classical compounds are generally a good read and they're used a lot in design um, of wastewater, for example, they found that a lot of these other compounds are very much present and very much important to the microbial metabolism. And so we wanted to see if we could develop a model that would incorporate this information, especially all these really more complicated carbon sources since most environmental systems aren't necessarily going to be dosed with acetate or anything. So in K-Base, not going to spend a lot of time on this because you guys have already spent um, quite a few hands-on tutorials on this. But as you guys have seen, we developed media based on the environmental concentrations of those key compounds. We used the genomes um, to build our metabolic models for the first, the ammonia oxidation, we um, did manual curation. Some of uh, well, you've met uh, Kayla 
and Peng Fei, I believe, helped us uh, fine tune those and curate to get the actual precise metabolic reactions that should be in there. But then we also did some media-based curation where we would set reasonable flux limits uh, for the reactions we know to be occurring. And both of those worked reasonably well. Um, so then from the flux balance analysis, we used those exchange fluxes as a sort of pseudo reaction to capture what you would see from outside the microbe. Um, because from the environmental perspective, what we wanted to be able to put into P Flowtran was the outside, the microbe reactions going on. So you guys saw earlier in some of the tutorials, this is the raw on the left, the raw output from KBase for the exchange fluxes. And we've got a script that uses the KBase API to download the models in FBA and translate it into reactions like here on the right that can then be plugged directly into a pflowtran in file and using that the infrastructure behind um, the web interface that Roloff was showing you earlier, these can actually be replaced uh, programmatically so that we can swap out those, these reactions as we change our system. There is st still some automation to be done, but we're pretty excited about where it is already. So then, given that chemistry and the microbiology, we then take any physical data we have, which can include that remote sensing data or other in situ um, collected data to build the physical side of the, the PFLOTRAN model. And then by running that through, we can get the chemistry. Oops, and I'm gonna skip ahead to get this because it's much more interesting to just show you these models. And these are publicly available. You don't need a login to play with these. Um, but you can say, if we want to just run the baseline model, and then say, I want to see what happens with pH, or I can plot the various nitrogen species. Um, it's all very interactive, which is exciting. Um, but then as Roloff showed, we can show ranges. And for this model, we decided to expose initial ammonium concentration, bicarbonate, and acetate concentrations just to see what that would do. So if I say vary the ammonia concentration, ammonium, sorry. So now we obviously get a lot more in the output, but that was a pretty quick change to show all of those different um, initial settings. Uh, we can also, you know, because as you saw earlier, there are a whole lot of different settings. We can choose different parameters to expose. So in this case, perhaps we want to see what happens if ammonium oxidizers are running at different rates. Um, so it just depends on what's useful to us and our scientists or our users, what they want to see. Uh, but it can be a really valuable tool for evaluating quickly the change that the different things will have. So then the next big step that was sort of addressed some earlier is that obviously running one ZRT model is, or ZRD model rather, that runs to exhaustion is still interesting. Um, and pretty exciting that we can do it, but ideally you want to be able to develop an iterative approach. So for that, I've been working on that since AGU when the rest of this was presented. Um, let me just switch over here. And here, in addition to the script that will automatically pull down the, the models in FBA and translate them into the scripts, um, after I, there is still some manual intervention there to create my new in files. Um, but then another script will spit out a media composition that can be directly uploaded to here. And I can run an FBA using the same original model on this new media condition. And basically slowly work towards a steady state as I run out of any given carbon source, I can see what, you know, given this new media condition, what the bugs are gonna do which still needs some fine tuning, but you can see it instead of just running to the ground when we run out of um, the first one, let's see, glutamate, it's able to continue and keep cranking on choline. Um, so that was 
pretty exciting. I thought, and we're approaching the point where they're starting to actually generate um, compounds previously exhausted. So I still need to fine tune the switching a little bit, but uh, by adding successive reactions that will begin to take place as things are exhausted, we can create a continuous system, which is cool. Um, so just a summary. Um, the online course that Roloff showed will hopefully give you a little more background on the reactive transfer modeling stuff, which is a whole lot. And uh, one week crash course is really, really quick to try to pick it all up. Um, we also hope you can play with our modeling interface and get a lot out of that. Um, and be able to make use of these tools without necessarily having to become an expert in PFLOTRAN and just this pipeline that we're very excited about and that we're continuously developing and improving. And I think that is my last slide. Okay, so I think we have some time left over. Uh, so I'm not sure if there's any questions, but we'll be gladly answering them. Uh, I know that uh, we sent out credentials to uh, everybody who had requested them. Um, if you still have other uh, 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 accounts, you can just uh, go to the same page and request them. So this course is open to everybody. So um, uh, the thing. So, so Rebecca, there was a question: if you can share the link for the K-based narrative that you developed, the iterative chemistry, the chemistry-based iteration one. Mm -hmm. um, I can, it's not very well commented right now, so it might be good if I do that first. Um, yeah. Cause yeah, it's, yeah. there's not much going on in that narrative. It's really just some models that I built in a different narrative and then I import media and run them success, success, yeah, successively. So it's not necessarily the most useful narrative yeah. share. And we're also still like, you know, obviously writing up some of these results over there on, on, this, uh, on this work here. Uh, but yeah, once we're, uh, we'll be glad to share the monster probably like a little bit further and have them a little bit more documented. Yeah. Um, any other questions? I'm looking at Discord right now, or I'm not sure if somebody's going to speak up, uh, or, or Tim, if you moderate that. Since we have time, I can also so show some more of what was going on there. I was um, rushing. Okay. Yeah, gonna... No, I think I think that might be great. I'm not seeing a lot of questions in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. I think you addressed the one on Discord. I know that I have not received my email back. Okay. From um, Subsurface Insights. So I don't know if there's, if other folks are having issues um, okay. um, receiving their credentials. I think it's been said. I'm like. I don't know if maybe I might have signed up before roll off. Is it possible that there's conflict if I signed up previously? Um, let me let me check over there. Like or like I also want to check ahead. your spam folders because since it was a lot of emails went out. Um, yeah. Sometimes that those can get pushed to spam. Yeah. So. Good, good um, okay. So Chris mildly got in, and and some I think some people can maybe it's PNNL that maybe it's the PNL spam folder uh, like keeping yours out at Tim there. Um, so I think uh, Swamini was asking what the capacity of the HPC is. Uh, so right now uh, we're actually running this on our. Uh, on one of our big iron clusters that, that we have, which is, you know, compared to the PNL cluster, it's not very big. Um, it's it's an 80 core system with, with 600 gigs there. I mean, I would say the, the big issue is uh, a lot of these models we showed are essentially like like zero D models and they run really, really quickly. I mean, really most of the time is spent in in sending the models to the server and 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 the, the server sending it back. It's, it's really the 3D models uh, which take a lot of time, but uh, basically all the models that we that we run here, uh, they run in, in fractions of seconds. Uh, yeah, and, and and if you if you haven't gotten your email, uh, you know, just drop me a. Um, you know, I think some people have gotten in there. So if you haven't gotten the email, you can also email me or just email learn at subserviceinsight.com and we'll, we'll 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 get you in there. Uh, Rebecca, you want to share your screen again and maybe go back to some of these narratives there. Uh, yes, um, I was just going to answer some questions in Discord, but I'll let you take okay. over and I will. Okay. Share again. Okay. You're probably better qualified than I to answer these questions over there. Um, okay. So I guess one person assessed the uncertainty of the simulation over there. Um, I'm not, 
I'm not completely sure what you mean by the uncertainty of the simulation. I mean, like the, uh, the, the um, so, 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 so the answer is we, we can do like a whole new analysis, like, like on the Jacobian, if that's what you mean. Um, do you know what would be meant by that? Is that what you mean, uh, Luciana? Uh, let me see. Um. So I think one one way definitely roll up is you know you can easily do parameter sweeps, right? So yeah, yeah. If you have uncertainty in your input parameters, you can do a whole suite of simulations quickly and see the range of outputs. Yeah, yeah. And 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 one of the things also I want to mention here is right now we expose this through um, through a web interface, but we also expose it to an API. And then actually the API runs 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 quick. Basically, the web interface talks to an API, and so the API you can basically submit like uh, uh, tens of thousands of models. I mean, we've, we've run, uh, you know, yeah, you can actually, and of course the moment you have like say three or four parameters, I mean, what you'll notice in the web interface, we limit ourselves that you can only do one sweep, what we call it. You can do only one, one sweep parameters because if you have say four parameters, you can sweep, it becomes very big very quickly, but we've run successfully like, like thousands of models or, or tens of thousands of models. And you can then really explore the parameter space very, very rapidly. Yeah, and, and, that, and the nice thing about it, architecture is, is uh, that's all there and that's all, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's API-able. So. Um, I guess, was there anything in particular anyone wants to see more of here, either in the narrative or um, in these two online models that I have? Just before I start winging it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so like I said, this one, the nitrogen cycling zero D is the one based on the literature model, which has the very basic, what you'd find in like McCaff and Eddy uh, wastewater treatment manual, uh, which is, as I said, effective, but it is used for treatment. And that's sort of why we chose these parameters to be variable. For example, in this case, we want to see what happens depending on the carbon source availability to denitrification. So as expected, not going to see much of a change for the nitrification side of things. But then it starts to spread out a bit. Um, and we can even extend this range a bit more. So, so I think one of the, the, the things which is, which is interesting that in the space of this presentation, we've run like, you know, probably like, like 40, 50 different models already, you know, without, uh, uh, you having to write your in file without the thing and you can visualize the results over there. So it's an extremely, uh, it, it's it, the, the, one of the reasons we developed this interface is making it easy for people who are interested in, in running models rather than uh, forcing everybody to build their own model, you know, and uh, uh, we hope uh, that uh, people find this useful. So Roloff, this morning someone asked about if there was a GUI for pFlowTran, and so in a sense you've provided uh, at least a limited GUI, right? So how do you how do you choose sort of what things, what aspects of the flow train you're choosing to expose here versus what you're setting or fixing behind the scenes? Um, we, we can complete the control. Basically, we can expose, you know, so we can expose any parameter in the PFlow train model. You know, so any parameter in the PFlow train model we can expose programmatically. I mean, I mean, obviously there's some things that that don't make a lot of sense there, uh, like you know, like the. Yeah, I, I I can't really think of something, but you know, we can expose material properties. So so, so the the interesting part of the architecture is, um, uh, this interface is sort of like designed to expose some of the things that people uh, think interesting. But I think what Rebecca showed is that you know we can have the same model 
but we expose three different things for these different models over there. Same, so so maybe somebody's interested in, 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 in the nitrogen, somebody else interested in the carbon, and we say, oh, we're just going to expose this thing. But we can expose any parameter. The, the reason why we don't expose all the model parameters, now the interface will be extremely busy over there. But yeah, it's, we can expose every parameter. And basically in the back end, we tell, uh, we tell the, the interface for, for, this, for this interface, what, what are you going to show to the user and what is called and what are the ranges over there? You know, so yeah, so this is a, so it, it's essentially like a, you know, I, I, I would claim that this is a, a, a full-fledged uh, interface to be floated. We have a, a 3D uh, and 2D visualization part that we didn't show in there, that we didn't include in this course here, because again, the 3D models take a lot of time to run over there. So we're still trying to work out how to do that, but uh, we do have that uh, component as well. And what what is your you know sort of policy for access to the system? Do I mean students are asking on Discord, can they have access after the summer school is over, or how do you how do you provide access to users, and what are the criteria? Okay, so so this course is is uh, is uh, free and open to everybody. So the 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 you know so people the only thing you have to do is they have to register for an account and then once you have registered for an account you can you can use it as far as much as you want. Um, I would say um, the uh, uh, um, the 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 constraint is if if you know somebody is is is, is bringing our service to the knees we may call them up say okay you know can you can you slow it down a little bit but you know as I said. Uh, a lot of the models we expose here are, are zero D or one D. Don't take much time. We have uh, multiple of servers we can use it on. So our objective is to provide this course for free for the foreseeable future for everybody who wants. And what what is your what is then your long term vision or maybe I guess the right word is business model for you know moving this forward and broadening it out for broader community use beyond just the learning modules. So, 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 so that's a good question. I mean, like, like the, the reality is like, you know, and, and, and uh, uh, for, for the people on the call. So, so Subservice Insight is a, is a small business. We're a commercial business. We're not academia. We're not national lab. Um, what our really uh, model is we build tools for subservice monitoring and, and, and um, this for us is a learning tool that we provide freely. Uh, um, we have integration with, with field data, and and and, and that's really the, uh, the the longer term. It's like these models, as you see here, um, people. Uh, um, so so for instance, we're working with some other people who say, hey, I have a site where I want to be able to upload my own uh, uh, composition or or other things. It's more a two D or three D model uh, that we run there. But this is really meant as a as a service to the community, also partly because this was funded. Uh, you know, by the U.S. federal government, and, and we think it's it's very useful for people to be able to do this here. You know, to to have a low activation energy through these models over there. Um, in 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 the longer term, it uh, um, you know, uh, we we have other ways in in which we plan to make models. So we don't pl plan to make money from this course. You know, we don't plan to charge a fee. We don't plan to. You know, but 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 if somebody says, "Hey, I want to run a, a 3D model in the cloud that pulls data and automatically from something else," okay, that that's more where where we work on. So this is maybe to part some extent is a it's a it's a test. It tests our servers, it tests our architecture, and the same architecture is being used for for model data integration. And and I think that's really maybe the answer to you is like a large part of the contextual data integration. That is where. Um, I think we can provide a service to people that through, and that we do it through a variety of mechanisms like collaborative agreements, uh, you know, directly funded work, uh, subcontracts, uh, service models. Does that answer your question? Yes, thanks, Rolof. Okay. Okay, but but you know, we we uh, um, I, I saw a question over there of the the format of the output files. Um, one of the things which is happening right now, and I just want to, to make sure like uh, pflowtran is just in the middle of being updated from version two to version three. Uh, the version we run in the background and the in files here are version two. Um, we're probably gonna move over to version three like in the next month and, and, and we'll take the system down and then version three will run over there. Um, there's a discussion going on right now on the pflowtran mailing list led by, by Glenn Hammond and other people over there uh, to to better find the data format. So there will be an update on the data formats once you migrate to version three, which uh, hopefully by by the mid or end of August or something like that. 
Um, so, um, okay, so I think it answered most of the questions I see on Discord. Um, uh, so, um, any other question that you saw, Rebecca, or any other things that people would like me to address here? Um, I, I guess one of the things I want to mention is, is uh, uh, and I mentioned very in passing, is uh, PyFlowTran. Uh, so PyFlowTran is a code uh, uh, which was developed by Satish Kara out of uh, Lenel, and uh, as part of the SBR, actually, uh, we provided funding to Satish to expand PyFlowTran so it could deal with uh, uh, with, with a whole large number of, of PyFlowTran parameters over there. And so uh, actually that, that the PyFlowTran is open source code so people can, can, can grab that as well and, and, and we use it extensively in our backend. Uh, There's actually, since we have time, I wanted to um, give a quick call out. It was touched on a bit earlier, um, but we've also been using Reaction Sandbox with some of this. Oh yeah, um, that's a good point, yeah. I wanted to point out we've been do, using that to do as they noted, more advanced kinetics, um, some of the environmental inhibition, like temperature inhibition, which you can't necessarily get just from the stoichiometry here. Um, my coworker, Ali Mayal, who I believe is in attendance here, um, is really fantastic with Sandbox and has been uh, putting together some really cool models. Uh, also, we've been looking at death kinetics um, and decay, which I guess sounds morbid, but is also really, really important, especially in these environmental systems. Um, and we're pretty excited about integrating that into this whole stack as well. Yeah. Yeah, think, think, think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the PFloater and Sandbox, for people who don't know it, and the PFloater and Sandbox is a bit of a acquired taste because it, it's not that easy to do, but it gives you this incredibly powerful a tool you can you can sort of like extend uh, the pfloating capabilities with and uh, and also couple things that uh, another parameter and 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 we haven't talked too much about it here is is really the use of um, uh, parameter estimation so uh, uh, that's work which is which is done uh, a lot by by uh, by Hein Zhu in, in in our in our team here and uh, um, uh, I think that the whole notion of hey using parameter estimation to 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 get at some of these model parameters is uh, something we hope to touch on in the coming uh, months as well. And, and we may actually even all expose some of those parameter estimation capabilities to, to the same course over there. So um, anybody has any questions, you can email learn.subserviceinstead.com or, or Rebecca or me, I think our credentials are here and uh, we hope that this is useful to people. Um, uh, I think we've had, uh, let me check uh, uh, so far, um, you know, we've had uh, uh, 41 people signing up. Uh, uh, we have, um, uh, and, and one of the nice things of our architecture is that it allows us to distribute jobs across our backend servers over there. So there's this automatic job allocation thing, which goes in machines, which actually sit in different places. So we're right now we're a virtual company and some of these machines are uh, in, in my basement and some of these machines are off the basement and my coworker in Idaho. And they, they, right now all these basements are being heated by the jobs you guys all submit. So. Um, uh, any other questions? I know that, that probably Michelle is coming up here shortly, Tim, but uh, any, uh, I think we have a few more minutes, so we'll gladly answer any more questions if there are. I see some coming up in Zoom. Did you address um, this one, uh, Roloff, how much modeling, how, how realistic is it to simulate, um, to do modeling with PFLOTREN on a local machine versus using large servers like you guys are making available or even larger clusters like at EMSL? So, so, so I would say like these models that Re Rebecca uses, these, these zero D models, you can run on a, you can run on, on a Raspberry Pi. I mean, you can install PFLOTREN on a Raspberry Pi. And by the way, if you don't know, Raspberry Pi is a $35 like, like single board computer. So you can install it on there. It will be like a little bit, you know, you have to get like a 16 gigabit like SD card and you have to install it there. And you can run the zero D model on there. So I think for zero, zero D models, you can do that. I think the problem is a little bit like, you know, that figure from, uh, from, from, from Carl Stiefel in the beginning is, is you want to integrate your, your modeling into a 3D reactive transport model. And that's, I think, where the crux is. I think these, all these zero D models, uh, you can run on, on very small machines. The, the problem becomes once you start integrating 
like for instance, uh, uh, temperature behavior. I mean, say like, you know, I showed some of this data where you have maybe like a, a temperature profile, you have uh, maybe like a, like an area where you have a, say like a 10 by 10 uh, square meter area, maybe like a meter deep and you have like, like a, a diurnal temperature behavior that you want to model, things become relatively complex. And I think that then links the, the fact that you need to integrate your, your, your zero D model into your 3D like, like, like transport over there. And, and that's where, that's where things start, 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 that's where you need bigger computers. But all these zero D and one D models, you can run them on, you know, probably the smallest computer you have without any problem at least from our experience. I mean, I guess the only big challenge is that, you know, installing, uh, uh, we, we uniquely run, we only run on, on Linux boxes. Uh, getting pflowtrain to run on a Windows box is, is possible, but sort of painful. Uh, on a Mac is, is pretty trivial, but I, I, but I guess like once you get it running, uh, uh, you know, these models should not be any computational challenge for, for the zero D or one D. So, um, so, um, okay, I, I think people are, are uh, having logged in. I think uh, um, any more questions? Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, so, uh, so right now, um, I think 45 people have logged in. We sent about 50 invites. So uh, I guess uh, other people will, will be coming, um, uh, you know, can can try it. I mean, like, and we'll leave this open, Tim. So feel free to post this in Discord and invite other people. Uh, and uh, I'll just keep you posted. Uh, you know, if we need to, if we need to borrow Emsel. <laughs> I heard Tim offering Emsel or not? Did, did somebody hear that also? That Tim said you can have Emsel resource if you want to. <laughs> so. Well, you can if you write a proposal. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so one of the nice thing, Nancy, and I just wanted to point it out there, is that. The, 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 the interesting part is, is um, we just run a standard pflowtrain instance that, that, that they have a little piece of code for. So we could, so some, if somebody says, hey, um, I want to run a really big model, we can put a, a pflowtrain engine on, your, on the Amsel computer. And because it's, uh, uh, it, it's, it's designed to sit behind the firewall, the only thing it do, it would basically retrieve jobs. It would talk to server, say, hey, give me a job, and then run it and send it back. And so the nice thing of this architecture is uh, you can actually have, you know, uh, you can have people have the, you know, just install pflowtrain and, and, and then get the little Python code we have, which just basically talks to our server, say, hey, give me a job. And, and, and it's a, so it's an extremely scalable distributed architecture. Um, you know, so uh, I, I, may, I may write a proposal, but, but I think so far we're good. Um, well, well, please do. We, we will have a call for proposals coming out, mm -hmm. um, like either this week or next week for these what we call exploratory they're one-year proposals mm -hmm. and access to our computational resources is definitely included with that yeah but there are many other capabilities that uh, at emsl that you can link that with so i am only only joking um in jest when i when i say send in a proposal this is an actual opportunity <laughs> yeah yeah yes, and, and, and and i think and i think one of the things there and, it, and i want to sort of like like actually like circle back to some of the, the challenges there is um uh, the, the the integration with the data like that was shown like uh, on, on the first day with wonders is something that we're really working on very hard because that's I think a large part of how do you pull this data in how do you like bring that data together how do you build those pipelines because the 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 interesting part of course we have this data tsunami and so what you really would like is saying hey data get analyzed at JGI or EMSL boom now you have the model and 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 so that that nobody really has to do this and I know to put these models out to work, but they'll find something else. Um, uh, uh, but you know, basically that, that and, and, and that's the vision we have. And I think if you can do that, it will allow enormous amount of stuff. And I think we built the infrastructure and, and I think that other people can build other infrastructure, which is similar, but I think it shows that you can actually automate a large part of this effort uh, very easily. So. Uh, that's wonderful. Yeah, it's very exciting opportunity. And I, I think it, you're absolutely right. It's that pinch point that really translates the data into knowledge. And then as Tim was pointing out, that whole modex cycle where the model then drives the next round of experiments. So yeah. just getting that, getting that crank and the gears working is, is we're, we're, we're right there. So yeah. it's very exciting. Okay. Okay, uh, well we have. Okay, sorry. 
I was just going to say we have uh, about four minutes before we're due to transition to Michelle, but um, if there are uh, any more questions, um, I know personally I'm still having difficulty logging in. It says I'm not a member of the team. I feel I feel rejected. <laughs> but I'll follow up with you later, <laughs> Roloff, uh, to log in. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll, anybody got anybody got problems? Just email me directly or, e or email, and, and it, it's possible that you know we miss your 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 thing there. But we'll you know if you cannot if you cannot get a signed up to your thing, just email me directly, and we'll we'll, we'll get it squared away. Okay, sounds awesome. Um, let's see. Why don't Why don't we then just take a, a quick break, and we'll be back. Um, in just three minutes, so time to go get a, a coffee or uh, other refreshment, and we'll have um, Michelle join us uh, at, at two o'clock. Tim, were there any um, comments that you wanted to make at this time? Um, so yeah, I guess a couple things. Um, one is just to, I put it in the chat, but there is a jobs channel of, over on Discord and um, Andrea shared a link in the chat that I moved into the jobs channel that gives a link to a LinkedIn site to points to one of our PNNL uh, recruiters. Um, and there's some information about internships and other kinds of uh, job opportunities at PNNL. And so that's an opportunity if uh, other groups or organizations have any jobs available, want to post in there, or if any of the uh, participants want to, you know, post your resume or express any job interest, feel free. And um, then the other thing is uh, some of the um, slides are starting to show up with links on the agenda on the website. So awesome. as we're getting those cleared, we're posting those. So I do want to point you to that. Um, if you head over to the website and look at the agenda, you can start to see some of the, the slide decks being posted. And um, Linda has told me that some of the recordings have now been posted on YouTube channel. So I'll be posting the link into the Zoom chat and onto uh, Discord after we start up in the next session. That's really exciting. I see, I was just out on the agenda. It looks like if there is a a colored, if you mouse over, it'll change colors if that presentation is available, so. Yes, that's right. So, yeah, I think there's um, the ones that are colored in, um, in bright red are the ones that have links in them, yep. That's awesome. Okay, well, I guess it is, it is now two o'clock as we, <laughs> <laughs> as time just flies by. So, Michelle, are you are you up and ready to go? There, there she Hello, is. Hello, everyone. Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much, Tim and, and Nancy and everyone else for um, hosting this. I'm really excited to get started and show everyone um, a, some different stuff uh, for this next tutorial session. We're going to be looking at using R in hydrology and um, I will be going over first an example of R in hydrology as well as a hands-on demonstration. So I think with that, um, if it's, I can go ahead and get started. I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen. Yep, please go ahead. Okay, great. And so I'm just so everyone's aware, I'm also going to be posting, let's see, some links in the chat box while I go through some of these slides. So that may just take me a moment to switch back and forth between the two. And I'll translate those links over to Discord as well. So Michelle, when you stick them in, I'll copy them into the Discord site too. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so I'm sharing my screen and hopefully the Zoom chat box is not covering it. Hopefully it's just the R slides. Okay, so thank you everyone. My name is Michelle Newcomer and I am a research scientist at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And today I'm gonna to be talking about using R in hydrology. And as I mentioned before, I'm going to show a few examples of doing this 
One being um, an example at the large uh, continental scale. And then another example, which we'll do together as part of this tutorial, using a Jupyter Notebook in a web browser. And that will be an example from the Russian River watershed, where I have done much work over the past few years characterizing the impacts of fires on that watershed. And so you'll see how an analysis in R could be done um, using, uh, using these type of tools. So before we, be, we begin, for the hands-on part of the tutorial session today, we will be using the Firefox web browser. So if you don't have Firefox, now would be a good time to download that and get that going. For, unfortunately, sometimes the, the, one of the R packages in the Jupyter Notebook, it doesn't work as well in Chrome. So Firefox, it just, it works fine. So I ask that everyone have Firefox installed for that today. So um, I will go ahead and move on. So the, this workshop began, um, well, I started developing this workshop in 2018 when I was invited to give a workshop on big data. And specifically, this is part of the um, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory California Water Big Data Challenge. And so that's when I started developing these type of tools using Jupyter Notebooks and, and binders so that people could run the notebooks online without having to install R or Python or any other software. So that was, um, you can, I'll post these links as well um, in just a minute. I further developed this workshop when I was asked to give this workshop again at the um, International Association of Hydrologic Sciences conference that was held last year. And this is part of the Young Hydrologic Society. And you can find um, a lot of resources on what this high hydrologic society is about and what we're doing. Um, so during that workshop, we had other guest speakers and they talked a lot about some of the new tools that are emerging using R, such as um, Krieging, Krie, Krieging approaches, which I, that question came up earlier about can, how can you include uh, like geostatistical heterogeneity, well, you can use these types of approaches. And there's also a new paper by one of our, our colleagues here that I will talk a little bit about today in hydrological earth system sciences discussions. And then finally, um, I, I continued developing this workshop as part of the um, AGU Department of Energy Early Career uh, Workshop, and that's the, that's the one I gave in December of last year where Tim and others got to be a part of that and see what we were what we were up to. So I'm going to go ahead and post some of these links now in the chat so you can take a look at those resources. So the the short course is really geared for any researcher who is interested in learning about applying R to a specific hydrological application. And this workshop today, I'm focusing on um, some simple tools to fetch data sets and, and do a simple analysis. But there's other, many more tools out there, including hydrological models, numerical methods, and other packages that are developed by the user community. And so it's a very well-supported community of hydrologists who um, are, are interested in using R for their applications. Oh, and as I mentioned before, if, you ha if you're just joining us now, please have the Firefox web browser installed. That will be part of our hands-on session a little bit later today. This workshop has also been inspired and developed by many other people. I'm not the first one to put something like this together. And, and certainly all the tools I'm showing you today, they've been shown by other people as well. So there's a very large community of people involved in this type of research and, and this type of workshop development. So I'd like to give um, just credit to all those people who are doing this. Specifically, there's been workshops at EGU using R in hydrology, and there are links provided, which I will put in the chat window. Um, there's links provided to those workshops. There's other presentations and tutorials on their Hydro Hydrological Society GitHub page. And then there's this paper that came out last year by Slater 
at all. Really looking at how hydrology is being used today, including recent developments um, and future directions. So I went ahead and put them in the chat window right now, some of those links. And R is growing. Uh, there's, there's been a significant adva advancement in the user community as well as the development of hydrological packages. And so here, um, the CRAN task view, this is essentially a, um, a web page showing all of the different packages specifically for hydrology. And this was, um, uh, this was developed by Zipper et al. More than 100 packages as of June 2020. This is driven by the increase in publicly accessible data as well as increases in computational uh, power, uh, analysis of complex data sets, such as the application um, that I'm going to show you at the CONA scale, continental United States scale. And there's an active and supportive community of users. Also, um, People are using this for a lot of types of applications, including data acquisition, analysis, modeling, statistics. It's also used as a GIS, so you can uh, visualize your data and show it in map form. We're going to be looking at a GIS application today. So you'll see an example of how you can use this um, for looking at water quality parameters in California. And you can also use it to, to publish. So, for example, using our markdown, you can have your model and your code all built into your paper and then publish that as your paper with your associated uh, data sets with your paper so that everything is uh, reproducible um, for, for your analysis. So, let me also share some of those links with you. So, Michelle, I know that there's a, a lot. Yes. When you when you Question. pass yes, when you post into the chat window, could you be sure that you're going to all panelists and attendees so that everyone sees the links? It may be only going to the panelists as a default. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, you're right. It said by default just all panelists. I'm sorry, everyone. Um, so I think Tim Tim has caught up on some of the earlier ones, but just moving forward it'd be easier. So, okay, yes, yes. Is, and also, are there, do I need to repost some of those links? Let's I think, I think Tim caught the earlier ones. So I think we're good. So just, okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, many apologies about that. I didn't catch that. So thank you, Nancy, for pointing that out. All right, let's see. I think I posted this one. This is slide five. And this is the CRAN link. Okay, perfect. Okay, so for today's workshop, as I mentioned, there is going to be two applications. The first is going to be a demonstration. And by demonstration, I mean an example of uh, some research that I've done at the continental scale using some of these tools. And obviously, I can't do that with you here because I have to use NERSC for that specific application because there's so much data and computational um, needs associated with that. But the other one will be hands-on and that one we'll all do together. And also after the workshop, you can watch the video that I did in 2018 on this workshop on YouTube. It's been posted on YouTube. So you can go back to this um, if you have, if you want to see something that I that I said or did or, or how to do something. So I think I got it to all, yes, got it. There's the YouTube video of this workshop. Okay, so the first is gonna be a demonstration of these capabilities at the CONUS scale and showcasing the power of these tools for analyses that we're interested in. So this, I, I'm showing here two different study sites. The first study site is one that is in the um, Upper Colorado River Basin. This is the East River. And this work at the Kona scale emerged from some of our science questions associated with this study site, such as 
how are watershed how how are watersheds changing in response to snowback conditions and what are what is the role of watershed characteristics um, and functionality on that change and specifically related to nitrogen so that that work at that one scale has led to an examination of how uh, water quality specifically nitrogen and carbon is changing across many u.s watersheds we can see that there are changes in, in the upper Colorado, but that leads to the question of how does that relate to changes across other watersheds in the United States. The second picture here is the Russian River, and this is located in Northern California, and the Russian River has experienced uh, multiple back-to-back -back fire years beginning in 2017. So each year we've had a fire within that watershed that has impacted the water quality um, in some way. So this, this concept of a watershed is important here because the watershed is an important integrator of changes that occur within uh, the, the system upstream. So for example, if there's a fire in one part of the watershed, that, that fire and the signal of that fire will propagate down because of hydrological flow conditions. So what we're thinking about here is how do in-stream measurements reflect those coupled hydrobiogeochemical processes as well as changes? Is, are they indicators of that changes? And because water and solutes and nutrients, as we've heard about from all of our previous speakers today and, and yesterday, that there are reactions and there are microbes and there's a lot of biogeochemical change that occurs as water flows in rivers and in hyperreic zones and in sediments, and that all emerges at a particular point in the stream, which is that that that's where it ends up. And so we know that that's a reflection in some way of that hydrobiogeochemical coupling upstream. So the idea here being that if we look at these indicators across many different watersheds, we'll be able to understand something about either the watershed or the particular um, processes that are occurring in that watershed. So as I mentioned, this is part of our watershed function scientific focus area. If you're interested to learn more about that, um, our, our website is at the top there. And we're, we're thinking specifically about how mountainous regions retain and release water, nutrients, carbon, and metal. So specifically for this demonstration today, uh, the research questions I am, I am focused on are how are trends in concentration, discharge, and export fluxes, uh, being loading is another term for that, how have they changed across the U.S. where we're using the watershed as a scaling construct and focusing on trends in those parameters? And how do those, those trends, uh, how are they changing and how does the timing of fluxes change? For example, um, across the U.S. are mass fluxes of carbon and nitrogen to the oceans, is the timing of that changing? Is it occurring earlier or later in the water year? And then what is the relationship to other factors that we, uh, variables that we have at the continental scale, such as atmospheric deposition or, or vegetation, remote sensing metrics that we can use to link water quality uh, to remote sensing? So, the, the methods that I'm using for this include um, a few R packages. So the R package is called data retrieval. Now this R package, this is one of the packages we're going to be using today in the hands-on demonstration that allows us to uh, fetch the water quality data from the USGS. So that's, that's um, like, it's like one line of code and then you fetch the data and then it uh, in real time gives you that data back. So today we're gonna be doing that for one particular station, uh, but in this demonstration, you can imagine uh, the computational needs if you wanted to do that for all stations, all of the USGS stations across the US. And then second, uh, we used this, this other package called EGRET, E-G-R-E-T, which uses the weighted regressions on time, discharge, and season method. And so this method allows you to 
predict uh, your concentration based on discharge using a series of um, statistical methods that link together concentration and discharge in um, what are called concentration discharge hysteresis curves. Um, so these links to the R packages, I'm going to provide them in a link here in the chat window. You don't have to download any of these for our hands-on tutorial today. They're already um, implemented in the Jupyter Notebook. So there we go. There's the link. And um, with the code that I'll show you today when we do the hands-on, you'll be able to reproduce this yourself either on your local machine um, or using the Jupyter Notebook. If you use the, your local machine, then you will have to download these our packages. So um, in, this, in this demonstration here, I'm showing all of the, dif the different water quality parameters. Um, they uh, there's a parameter ID. There's also a parameter name. So we're going to be um, focused on dissolved, um, dissolved inorganic nitrogen, uh, parameter 663. One there at the, the second line. So we're focused on that parameter today. And as I said, uh, for this demonstration, uh, you can't do it just using your Jupyter Notebook because it's too big, uh, but there are other R packages to help you accomplish um, analysis of big data sets. Um, they, there's some functions that include um, uh, using like parallel processing, um, MCL apply is one, using big mem um, packages. That way you can, like when you have 300 gigabytes of RAM that you need, uh, you can use these packages to do this type of analysis. And so here is the example of what we get from that type of analysis. We get continental scale data and analysis, and we can really begin to zoom out, uh, like what's happening at the large basin scales, and then zoom in for what's happening either at the station scale or at other um, hydrological unit scales. So here I'm showing multiple scales. Um, for example, um, I'm highly highlighting the Pacific Northwest up at the top left because our host today Pacific Northwest Lab, this is their basin, and we're looking at, you know, trends in um, nitrate concentration over the past 50 years. And so this is where the power really comes in of using some of these R packages. And so I won't dive into too many de details of this, but if you do have other questions, feel free to reach out, because um, now I want to move into the hands-on part of our tutorial so we can have some fun um, during this next stage. Okay, so that's, that's the demonstration of what you can do with these type of tools. Now we're, we're going to start to do some of that. So we're going to look at um, one particular case on the Russian River examining fire impacts. So for this next stage of the analysis, I'm going to start to switch over between screens here um, so that I can show you in Firefox how we're going to do this. We'll do this together um, and then I'll send the link everyone's way so that you can follow along and do this as well. So I'm going to stop sharing really quickly and get that switched over. So first, um, while I get this switched over, um, I guess I'll check in with folks and see if there are questions before we move on. I don't see anything in the chat right now or, or over in Discord. I think a lot of people are massively clicking on links that you've set out and, and uh, <laughs> maybe navigating over to your um, Firefox. But I have to say, okay. this is awesome, Michelle, because we started the week, you know, really at the molecular scale and now we've gone all the way up to the continent. So that's, I love it. <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm looking going, I know what I'm going to be doing this evening. <laughs> it's just... Uh, <laughs> It's, it's, it's really incredible. a lot of fun, <laughs> it's, it's, especially when you see the hands-on tutorial today. You can, 
change the station. If you're interested in the Pacific Northwest stations, yes. you can go take a look at your own. Um, so I am sharing my screen and I'm showing right now Firefox. Let me make sure that every. So in this first step, what we're doing, um, and let me make sure I get this binder link over to everyone right now. This is the binder link. This is how we're going to open up the Jupyter Notebook within Firefox. Um, so as you can see, the binder, it's processing right now. It takes a moment to start. And OK, there we go. So it started for me. So I'll give everyone else a moment for it to start for them as well. Sometimes it can take a few minutes to start. And if it has started for you, then the next step is to click on the Jupyter Notebook. It's called rrwqfinal.ipymb. So you click on that, and that gets you into the, um, the notebook that's ready to run. Yeah, great. Mine, mine just finished loading, and I'm in. So thanks, Michelle. This is it's okay, great. good. So Tim got in and everyone else's should start. The one part of this that I don't know what's going to happen is since all, I don't know, 100 of us are attempting to do this at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's such a large scale that I don't know what will happen. So this will be a good test for that, I guess. What could go wrong? <laughs> what could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> but once you're in, once you're in the no, once you're in, and then once you click on the RRWQ final IPIMB, um, then it takes you to the actual notebook that will run together. Okay, so someone else, Annette said they're in, so that's good. It's working for folks. Um, other people. Okay, so I'm guessing we're having some smooth sailing thus far. So in order to run this notebook, all that you as the user have to do is click on run. That's just this little button um, right here at the top. You just click run and that runs that particular section of code. So as you see, we're loading the libraries right now. I haven't updated the libraries in a while, so we get a few errors, but that's okay. It's, everything is still going to work for us today. So don't worry about um, those errors with the libraries. We're, we're using multiple libraries today, including the data retrieval library, the egret library, leaflet, um, HTML, HTML widgets, ggplot2. You might have heard about these in other, I don't know, papers or tutorials, but specifically the ones that I called out earlier are data retrieval and egret and that's how we're going to be fetching some of the data and doing the analysis so good i'm seeing more folks are in and able to run it so that's great um, everything seems to be working so what we're doing today within this uh, jupyter notebook we're exploring the impact of the north bay fires on the russian river and if if you don't know, um, in 2017, there were a series of pretty devastating wildfires that occurred overnight in the Russian River watershed. And um, it killed many people, over 44 people were killed uh, during this overnight fire event. And it, it impacted not only the rural regions, um, also urban. You can see a picture here where it swept through many neighborhoods. So this was, a, this was a pretty devastating fire for this region. And after 2017, there have been fire events that have occurred. Um, in 2018, uh, there was another series of fires. And in 2019, there was the large Kincaid fire. 
So we've, since 2017, um, we, we implemented with our collaborators, and um, our collaborators are folks at the U.S. Geological Survey. They include uh, Jen Underwood, who is also on the call today um, on the, um, as part of this workshop, so thanks for joining, Jen. And then there's others um, who are part of it as well, um, who what we're doing is we're, we're collecting water quality samples at multiple locations within the watershed. And these include tributaries and the main stem of the Russian River. And they allow us to supplement um, well, all of the US Geological Survey data with our own data sets that are a bit more detailed. So we're collecting things like um, anions, cations, nutrients, uh, mercury, for example. So we're really doing a large suite of analysis on those samples. And there's also within the notebook, there's links to some of the resources here. Specifically, um, if you look at the USGS water data website, that's where you can interactively look at a, a map and find stations that are available for your watershed. Okay, so as I mentioned, just um, after the, the 2017 fire, uh, we, we implemented this sampling program and you can read more about that sampling program at our news link. Uh, but this, this was specifically designed to capture the effects of the fire on the Sonoma Quad Qu County Water Quality uh, Monitoring Program. There is, the Russian River is used for drinking water through a series of riverbank filtration systems. So it's important to monitor the river for any changes that may happen. So we're going to use some functions uh, that's going to be in this next step here to look at some of these data sets. We're going to automatically fetch the data from the USGS server, and then we're going to plot the data and map the data so we can look at essentially um, like across, across California, we're going to look at a lot of data. So this is this is the, the start of that. So in this next section here, these are called functions. Now, many of you who know R, you already know what a function is, but a function is a set of code that allows you to, to do something. You can think about it like maybe a mathematical function. You, you give it something and then it gives you something back. So we have two functions here and we'll just click the run button. And then the functions are done. They don't really do anything right now until we call them later. But those, these functions, they've been run, and they're going to sit and wait for us to provide, provide some more information. So the next step is to actually gather the water quality data. And we're going to do this for one station. This is the Guerneville station. And so each site, um, each station by the, from the USGS has a site ID. So I've already selected the site ID. This is the site ID for the Guerneville station. So the Guerneville station, it's not directly inside of a fire perimeter. However, if we go back to the concept of a watershed, this, wa this site is downstream of all of those fire zones. So all of the tributaries and streams, they eventually emerge into the main stem of the Russian River. And then this site, the Guerneville site, this is the most downstream site. So we anticipate that this water will reflect the history of, its, of the travel path of any water, water particle. And so what we're going to do next, we're going to run section four. This is where we're preparing our input values. So we have our site ID. This is the Guerneville station. We have the start starting date for when we want to, when's the earliest sample we want to collect. I have it uh, quotes in, bl in blank quotes so that I can get the earliest value, whenever was the earliest data available. And then I have an end date. So this gets data up until um, July of 2018, but if you left this blank, it would get into 
all the data until the most recent end date. Here, uh, this is the parameter code, and I initially thought we were going to look at uh, inorganic, dissolved inorganic nitrogen, but I'm wrong. This is the uh, code for pH. So today we're going to be looking at pH. But you could change this parameter code, let's say if you wanted to look at inorganic nitrogen or dissolved organic carbon or oxygen. So every, every water quality constituent has a parameter code and you would input that parameter code there. Okay, so did I run that section? I will run it if I didn't already. There, that section's run. Then we're going to fetch the data. This is the section that will go grab the data. And specifically, this is the line right here. This is the function get WQ daily, get water quality daily. And the inputs to this are the site ID, the parameter code, the start date, and the end date. And then, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to get that water quality, and I'm just going to clean up the names of the, the column headers, so that way they have um, names that make sense, like date or month, decimal year, water year, um, the actual pH value. So I'll run this section of code. It should be pretty quick. should take just, that was quick. Right over here on the side, if there's a little um, asterisk in the place of the four, it means that it's running. So here we ran it, it looks good. And then we'll just take a quick look at the data. So if you use this line of code, um, click run, you can see what the data looks like. So we have our date column. On the left, we have pH, the value of pH, in the second column, and then um, the other uh, columns, like the month, January being month one, or the day, the decimal year, or the month sequence, or the water year, that helps you with doing, um, let's say if you wanted to do analysis by month, or analysis by water year, then you can uh, use these columns for that. And I specified here in this next section, what do all of the different components of the code mean. Okay, so now that we've collected our data, we can plot it and see what it looks like. So in this, in this line of code, I'm going to plot the pH data by month. I'm interested in seeing how pH varies across um, the entire period of record when it's binned by month. So what does the average January look like or the average February? So in this line of code, we'll click run, and we'll get a box plot. And this is how pH varies across the water year. So January is one, July is seven. And you can see there is a, uh, a normal seasonal cycle associated with pH. So when there's any analysis of changes, Let's say, you know, we go back to the question of how has fire impacted water quality? We have to know what are the baseline conditions, not only um, the average baseline conditions for the river, but also by month, because we know that there are seasonal changes. Even if we dig a little bit deeper and we look at daily time scales, we see that there are diurnal variations in pH. So there's a lot to consider when you're when you're asking the question, how has, let's say, pH or nitrogen changed since um, this other period of time after something like a fire? So we have this as our baseline to work against. Next, what we're going to do, so we've taken a look at this figure. We see that there's some seasonal variability. Uh, we're going to start to think about the role of the fire. So we're going to classify the pH data using a simple pre-fire, post-fire classification. Pre-fire being, I will classify everything that's before September of 2017 as pre-fire, and then everything that's after September of 2017 as post-fire. So simply before and after. 
So that's this next step. We're classifying the pre and post fire data. And then we can look at it. Um, so now that I've classified it, I can look at how pH um, is different depending on that classification. So we run the next section of code. And then this gives us the next set of box plots. So it's similar to the box plot we just looked at, where we looked at pH as it varies across the year. But now we also have the classification. So we've split our data set into two categories, the pre-fire and post-fire. And so we see here in red is post-fire pH and blue is pre-fire. And so these are, this is the distribution of the data for January also now classified. So we can see for January, here's in general what the distribution is like pre-fire, and then here's the distribution post-fire. So we can see that the median has shifted upward, um, but pre-fire, there's, there's a larger interquartile range. So there's a, there's a lot of statistics to consider here when thinking about what, how has it changed post-fire. In February, this is when we see some interesting shifts. So this is the, the February data classified, pre-fire is blue, post-fire is red. Now we see a larger shift in the distribution of post-fire February data um, relative to pre-fire. Here we see the median is shifted more significantly upward than in January or some of the other months. Um, but the distribution of all that prior data is much larger. And so this was a this is a simple pre post fire um, classification, but one can imagine that to to get more into the details here, we would need other we need other factors. For example, atmospheric rivers and our drought conditions. That that changes pH. So perhaps like the next the next step would be, okay, how do, how does then dry year pH differ from wet year pH? And what are the differences in pH between those years? We know that the fires occurred during a rel relatively dry year. So the next step would be to further segregate the data into dry year and wet year conditions, and then really look at how pH varies across those different water year conditions. Okay, so then the next step, uh, this is where we're going to get into some, some mapping. So this step here, we're going to do another data grab. This time, we're going to fetch data for the entire state of California. And we're going to grab a very uh, limited range of dates because it's such a large data set. And um, it sometimes takes about one minute to fetch. So I'm going to start running this while I talk you through this. So it'll take about a minute to fetch all the data. Oh no, it was quick. Okay, for me it was quick. Hopefully for you it's quick too. And it's for the state of California. Specifically, we're getting pH from those specific start dates and end dates. And don't worry about the warning message. We can ignore that. Um, so if we take a look at what this data looks like, so this is collecting data uh, from multiple sources. It, it includes NWIS, but it also includes um, like CDEN data comes here, other, other databases. I'm forgetting off the top of my head the name of those databases, but they're all included in this data set for the state of California. So you can see here, we can uh, scroll through this data set uh, to see more information about it. Okay, so in this next section, uh, what we're going to do, we're going to do a little bit more um, refining of the data. We're going to do some averaging for the different stations. Um, so I don't have too much time left today, so I'll just get to it, run that section, and then um, we'll further just look at, you know, what we just did. And then this is where we get into the mapping. So I'm in section 14. Um, the mapping will allow us to see pH concentrations using colors as well as sizes, and it will be an interactive map. 
So once we run uh, the leaflet map, and there we go. So this becomes an interactive map where we can zoom in onto uh, the different locations where there's data. And we can click on these data sets to see where was this, what is the value, and uh, yeah, so this is, this is pretty fun to play with this to see how pH varies across the state of California using um, this, this, this cool uh, data fetching technique. So I think with that, I will stop and um, allow you all to ask me questions um, if anything wasn't clear. So thank you. Thank you, Michelle. I was I was just um, going to say if you had a few more minutes, we, we don't need to rush to wrap up. So we're we're going to mm -hmm. our private session shortly. But if um, but I really I appreciate you presenting this to us, and this is this is super interesting. Thanks, so there is one question, um, and I I have to second that. That's just it's really just fascinating. Um, and seems really easy to use. There is a question, is this information only for the US or can you um, gather data sources from other you know, continents? So this particular package and this particular set of code is only for the US, um, specifically because this is uh, from, from the USGS. So, this package has been built uh, by the USGS for, for retrieving their data sets. So it is very specific to the US as of right now. I have not explored other databases or other R packages, for example, like from, like if you wanted water quality for, for another country, there would have to be either a specific database that you, you go and you, ha you write your own line of code to go fetch it, or an R package maybe that somebody has developed for mm -hmm. other d water quality data sets. So yeah, it's, it's variable around the world. There was another uh, question in here about, uh, apparently I, I didn't see, but someplace on the map, there's a river with a pH of two. And <laughs> Oh yes, I think I saw that as well. Um, let's zoom into that. Over here, I think. In Northern California, a value of three or a value of five. Yeah, I, a lot of uh, QAQC needs to happen. So this, this data set, I've just done a quick fetch and a quick mapping. But um, if, if you wanted to, you know, do more QAQC and really dig in with, you know, what's going on with this value or that value, that, that would need a little bit more work. Or even saying like, I'm gonna cut off all data that seems weird. Anything above, for example, nine, just uh, 132 just seems weird. So you would, you would, you would have to remove those values. <laughs> these, these, these values are suspicious, I agree. That's really, that's great. That's really interesting. So um, I was gonna ask, so Michelle, if we're playing around with this in your binder, and we change parameters because, for example, um, uh, someone, thanks Nancy Marino, posted a link to all of the water uh, quality codes for USGS. So if I wanted to change and look at, say you were saying inorganic nitrogen or something, I could change that code. How is that working in terms of me working on this binder? Is this like making a copy that I can play with or am I messing you up if I change something or how does that whole system work? Um. I don't know actually what would happen. <laughs> that, that's a really good point, Tim. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know if we all start playing with this one, what would happen? Because I have these files locally. So I have them locally that it's pushing to a, a GitHub. So on the binder itself, the binder, like I have to push, put these files themselves on this, this binder. So I'm not really sure. <laughs> okay. I'm not really too worried because I can I can you know rebuild this stuff um, pretty easily. <laughs> it would be really fun if you don't mind us playing around with it and looking at it and you know tr trying some different things. But I didn't want to mess anything up. So yeah, yeah. I, I think I think you're okay. It might not let you save it. 
Okay. I'm not sure. You can you can test it. Maybe if you make changes, I don't know if it would even let you save. I think I saw something when I did I did change something or I ran something and then it flashed up briefly by the little window that says not trusted. It said something about file saved, but I don't know. And oh, okay. Auto saved up in the top, but anyway, yeah. I just saw a Discord question. Um, Paula says. Uh, that was really cool. Which R package did you use to make the interactive map? And if that's something only for USGS data, would you know of anything else that could be internationally accessed? Paul is coming to us from the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. Okay. So specifically for the map, I used Leaflet. So Leaflet is this, this package here that can be used to do um, any type of mapping for whatever data you have. So it's very... Um, broad. Now, specifically for this data that I mapped, it's only for the U.S., but I can imagine if you have your own water quality data set, you can do your own mapping with Leaflet. Okay. Yeah, I don't, um, are there other, other questions out there? I'm sort of checking chat and our Looks good, lots of, lots of thanks and uh, great job, so. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thanks no, everyone. it was really wonderful presentation and uh, yeah, that's really cool. So that is interesting though, the um, the interface through this, yeah, um, whether we could clone one, uh, you know, save it as a different name. That's an interesting question. I guess it does say unsafe so, changes. So um, yeah, I, I think you, you can you can definitely um, like copy these files and then you can run the the Jupyter notebook on your like on your own machine. Um, it's just, it's the binder itself that I have set up to allow everyone to run R without having to install anything. Okay, yeah. All right, well, um, Tim, any, any suggestions here on how, how you wanna negotiate this? We have about 10 minutes left, I think. Um, um, whether we... Well, actually, I think. Oh we, no! I guess I yeah, guess I we're, we're we're scheduled to go into our um, breakout rooms at two forty-five. Yes, so. I'm sorry. Yeah, so that's fine. Um, I, you know, yep. we're not in All right. Well, Michelle and yeah. Uh, well, thanks then to Michelle again for a wonderful presentation and all the speakers that we had this afternoon. The, the twenty-eight lucky, lucky students. I wish you good journeys in your. Um, tutorials this afternoon and uh, tomorrow we have another great day of looking at uh, the application of some of these OMLIX informed reactive transport modeling to specific systems and that should be really exciting um, plenary lectures so um, see you all tomorrow and uh, thanks again for a great day <laughs>